great. What is that? Oh, am I supposed to talk? Okay. Yeah, it can hear me. Okay. They also have non cob salad foods at Dawson. And like, we'll make you sit at a separate but close by table if you don't order the cob salad. Yeah, yeah. Oh, just kidding. But if if Alvaro said they have a good salad, like I would trust that. Okay, okay. Let me move this thing. And like, all right. Oh, what was going on with us, huh? So last time I talk about that like it was weeks ago, last week on this show. Um, I also wrote, I almost wrote last week. Okay, last time, right? We, um, and I'm just recalling the notation because I will continue to use it. Um, we had a, a DVR, a discrete valuation ring. So that's a principal ideal domain that has a unique non-zero prime ideal. Yep. I shall try. That one, maybe? No, that says expand. So, You're welcome. All right. So, anyway, it's still a DVR, right? Uh, has a maximal uh, or prime, you know, it's non zero ideal generated um, by an element which we call pi, um, the prime, the non zero prime ideal. Um, K is the fraction field of A, and uh, V is the valuation. Okay, so every DVR, by having a single non-zero prime ideal, automatically has a valuation that's essentially counting how divisible you are by this um, unique up to unit irreducible element. Um, so this all happened, and then we discussed how when we have a valuation or an absolute value, this brings our attention to the holes and then we can complete the field and or the ring, right? So uh, the notation we'll have is K um, pointy hat, the completion of K with respect to, I'm gonna write the valuation. I mean, you know, I guess the absolute value given by the valuation, um, A hat, the completion, of A. And um, there's one more thing that I forgot to write that, well, you know, um, the little field K, which uh, Sarah also denotes as K bar, but actually sometimes he also uses little K so you know that he knows the truth somewhere. Um, and this is A mod pi, but that's also a hat mod pi. Whoops. Right, we're here, okay, I'm using the same notation, but that's the ideal generated by pi in A, and that's the ideal generated by pi in A hat. Okay, so that's all our notation that we um, developed. So, yeah. Yeah, but if you restricted it from the DVR, it would still be a homomorphism, just not surjective. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, so now on lecture three or four, we're gonna define local fields. Okay, so um, when K is already complete, so I'll write that as K is equal to K hat, right? 
K is that happens, you know, sometimes you're just thinking about QP already. Um, and little K, K other hat is finite. We call K a local field. And um, a kind of fun fact, if you're into that kind of stuff, these facts that K is complete and the residue field is finite actually implies that K is locally compact. I'm not going to talk about that um, at all. You know, I would have to talk about topology. I don't know who all has done topology before, but if you know what that means and that brings you comfort, I'm happy to give that to you. And in that case, uh, just as a like fun note, since it came up, um, note that in that case, um, there is a better choice. I mean, that's the choice we already made. Like we already made the best choice. Like I wouldn't lead you the wrong way, right? But there is a better choice um, of base A for the absolute value. Right, so recall that um, if K has valuation V, um, we can define the absolute value of X to be A to the V of X for A somewhere between zero and one, right? And when we talked about the piatics, I used A to be one over P, okay? And so, you know, so on Monday, I gave a glib answer about why we should use one over P. And then on Tuesday, I gave an answer like coming with Q and it's different absolute values of why you should pick one over P. And then today I'll give another reason why you should pick one over P. Um, so you like really, really should pick one over P is like what I'm saying, right? Um, th the choice is a is one over Q for Q, the size of the residue field, or this one, right? So remember, right, um, I'm assuming that the residue field is finite in, in this, you know, two slides. Um, and so in that case, right, the, the size of this finite residue field is a power of a prime, which I may call Q. And then um, the choice A uh, of one over Q to define the absolute value is particularly good because it agrees with the Haar measure on K. Um, it's a good choice because um, if, I don't know, U is a measurable set, I'm sorry, U is an open set, I just can't, is a measurable set, mu, the Haar measure on K, then mu of X times T, Right, so you take every element in your set and you multiply by X, so you kind of, you know, maybe make it bigger um, is the absolute value of X times the measure of T, okay? So this is kind of, you know, a little advanced. If you don't know what a hard measure is, then maybe you want to ignore that, but just know that if you take measure theory um, later, this might come up again. You, you might find yourself happy that you chose, um, you know, one over P or one over Q as your base for the absolute value. Okay, so that's just like one more reason. Okay. So today I'm just like trying to uh, finish like a bunch of little loopholes. So we're gonna have a little bit of a change of topics now. So this kind of like ends um, the definition part of things.
Now, I just want to take a short digression. On why call it local. Right, like I said, a ring with a unique maximal ideal is a local ring. Um, um, complete field with a discrete valuation and a finite residue field is a local field. Like, why do we say local? Like, what does, you know, buying food that's been grown near you have to do with like any of that? Right. So, um, the, the, so, so local is as opposed to global in this situation. So there's global and local. And, um, one thing that I'm not going to write down, um, because it's like so far field that I, I don't want to like get into the details, but if you have a variety and you take a coordinate ring for it, then that will be, uh, a kind a global object, right? Like you think of it as like the coordinate ring works for your whole variety. And if this means nothing to you, just like tune out for a minute and come back when I do a different example in a minute. That's why I'm not writing this one. You'll know when I write again. Okay, so that's um, the global object. And the prime ideals in that ring correspond to points in your variety. And when you localize at that prime ideal, the ring that you get is a ring of functions that are defined at that point, that don't have poles at that point. And so, you know, the global object gives you all the functions on the whole thing. And then the local object allows you to zoom in really near a point. So for me, like that's where the global local comes from. Now, um, the same kind of thing is it's true if you think of the integers, right? Um, if if you if you get into you know schemes and all that, um, you might see the integers drawn as kind of a line, and um, it's primes, you know, as as points on that line, right? And so you can think of z as a kind of like a big object, like it's it's global z all around the world, right? And then when you localize at a point, you can think of like looking like right near that point, right? So let's localize that three. Let's not switch primes mid story, right? When you localize that three, you don't allow three as a denominator, right? You allow everything else as a denominator because now you've stopped caring about any of the other points. And you're like, okay, like what is, you know, good near three, like right here, you know? And so everything that might be divisible by, you know, 11, like those all don't matter, right? So the global ring is big, as many primes. And then like the local ring is just looking at like what stuff is good near one of those primes that you have in your global object. Now the generalization of that is to replace Z with something we call a Dedekind domain. Okay, so a Dedekind domain is a Noetherian integral domain. Okay, and just to remind you, um, this one just means no zero divisors. I don't know why I always find the expression integral domain to be scary. And then I'm like, it just means no zero divisors. And I'm like, no big deal. So anyway, um, integrally closed. So that's a little bit more complicated. Um, and such that every non-zero prime is maximal. Okay, this is all true about Z. Like your, your babyest best Dedekind domain should be the integers. Okay, they're Noetherian. This means every ideal is finitely generated. Z is a PID, so it's like super Noetherian. It doesn't have zero divisors. It's integrally, integrally closed in Q, right? There's a monic polynomial with integral integral coefficients 
and it has a root, that root has to be, uh, and it has a root in Q, that root has to be in Z, okay? And um, every non-zero prime in Z is maximal, right? There's, you know, there's no bigger ideal that contains two. There's no bigger ideal that contains three. There's no bigger ideal that contains any of those, okay? And um, a Dedekind domain has, has the property that every localization is a DVR, okay? And if you think about it the right way, if you think about it my way, right? I think of the definition as de of Dedekind domain kind of the other way as being like, you want for your ring that every localization is a DVR. Like you're like, look, this ring is big, it's complicated, it's got a lot of primes, I cannot deal with that. I want to know that if I localize, I'll get like a nice object that I can deal with, right? That's your Dedekind domain. Every time you localize them, you know you'll get a DVR, you know you'll get a really nice object to deal with. And every ring of integers in a number field is a Dedekind domain. So that's, you know, that's the, the way in which I think of that as, you know, um, a generalization of Z. Like as you go to bigger number of fields, the ring of integer is no longer a PID. Like you, you can't expect that, but it's not so bad, right? At least all the localizations are DVRs, that kind of stuff. Okay. Okay, so I finished this whole page. That's great. All right. So um, now for the rest of today, we'll just peruse some facts about DVRs and complete DVRs so that you know, right? So I feel like this whole time I've been like, oh, you want to put yourself in a really nice situation. You want to, and you know, and it's like I haven't really sold the nice situation. So like this is the time. So um, all references below below um are to Sarah's local field book um the english version if there's any uh, conflict with the french version so section chapter two i don't know paragraph four proposition five Okay, so let A be a complete DVR. Okay, so that's important here. So there'll be some theorems where we'll need a complete DVR and some theorems that will be true for all DV. Well, anyway, you'll see. Okay, but here you need a complete DVR. So you don't just take Z and localize it, right? Like invert all the not primes, but you also complete so you're actually using zp right so think if, if you want to be thinking of something um in particular think about zp the piatic integers um and let s be a set of representatives of um sorry the residue field which is just a mod m um, in a, right? So, you know, this residue field, I mean, is a field, it has its own life, right? But it, it's also um, cosets of this ring a. So you, for each coset, you can just pick like any representative of that coset and you just like put them all in your little set, right? So this set has the same size as k, one for each of them. Um, then, every x in k the field of fractions is of the form x is equal to the sum and starting at some finite index and not going possibly all the way to infinity sn pi to the n for sn in s Okay, so the beauty of a complete DVR 
is that its elements are simple. They're essentially in a certain way, just power series in the uniformizer with coefficients in the residue field. And you should be thinking here, right? I'll, I'll write in blue for the piadic numbers, right? We had like AI P to the I, I guess, sorry, A and P to the N, because now I'm using N as my indices, A and P to the N. And we said that A N was between zero and P minus one. So that was exactly our set of representatives for the finite field with P elements, right? And P was our uniformizer. And so if you accepted that, then this is the same statement, but using, you know, fancier letters. I don't, is pi fancier than P? Yeah, okay, fancier letters. But do Greek people think P is fancier than, no. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. That was just a joke. Um, and the proof really is not that bad. So I'll just give you a quick proof. Like, I don't, I don't want you to think that there's like any magic here. Okay. So, okay, first, um, notice that if I prove this for elements in A, then I get it automatically for elements in K because elements in K are just elements of A with pi's on the bottom, right? So um, proof, if X belongs to K, there is A in A with X is just A divided with pi to the m for some m, some integer m. That's from when we wrote x is u times pi to the n, and a is like v times pi to the m or whatever, right? But that's a unit in a, so you know, I just like leave it there. And the idea is like, well, if, if this n is negative, right, then I, I just think of it as like being on the bottom, you know, and then like the top is an A, right? I'm going to erase that because it like barely makes any sense without words. So I don't want to leave that there. Okay. So it's going to be enough to prove, right? If I can prove that every element in A is some power series, then every element in X is going to be a power series too. Because if I divide by pi, right, it'll just like shift my power series. And I'm allowing negative exponents, so that's not going to be a problem. So I'm going to focus on A and A. Okay, so um, let A be in A. Um, then there is S naught in my set S such that A is congruent to S naught modulo M, right? Because S is a set, a full set of representatives, so A has got to be congruent to one of them. Okay, so A is equal to S naught plus pi A one for some A one in A. Right? Remember that M is just the ideal generated by pi. So saying. Um, that A is congruent to S naught, it's just saying that A is S naught plus a multiple of pi. And then repeat, 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 right? A1 is congruent to some S1. Oops, that's an A2 right now. Right? If A1 is congruent to S1 mod M. So that's S naught plus pi S1 plus pi squared A2. Okay, and so on and so forth. Keep going forever. All right, you do that one, you keep going, you keep going. And because you allow yourself to go to infinity, I mean, you might need to, you know, so, so you do. Does that make sense how you all get 
something like that out of it. So now, right, everything in A, therefore in K is of this form. And conversely, all of these are in K because K is a complete field, right? So these are all, you know, convergent series. So I can write them, you know, by doing like partial sums, right? So I can, you know, be like, oh, here's a sequence of elements and like it's got to converge because my field is complete. So all of these belong to K and every element in K can be written in that form. And so like that's what they are. So complete DVRs, complete fields are relatively simple. You can understand them in terms of their residue field and their uniformizer. No, yeah, it doesn't need to be finite, right? You could have like a, a po like a power series ring over a field that's not finite, and that would still be the case, right? You you would still, you know, find like the constant term mod t, whatever it is, and and so on. So it it doesn't depend on it being finite. Oh, I'm just um, defining S1 to be the number that A1 is congruent to. Yeah, okay, so let me go through that again. Thank you for pointing out that I went too fast. So A1 is in A, so it's got to be congruent to something in S mod M because S is a full set of representatives of A mod M. So I define, right, so I should say, like, if we define S1 to be um, the element in S with, with this congruence. And so then you can put it there and then you keep going. Like you can always find the next S. All right. So the next theorem is not going to be so impressive, but I'm going to use it in the other theorem. So hang on. So that's still in uh, chapter two, because that's the part about complete um, fields. And this one is proposition three, actually. Okay. So if K is complete with respect to um, a discrete valuation, okay, A, the valuation ring, et cetera, right, same, same notation as before, and L over K is a finite field extension. And say um, that the degree of L over K is on. Then you can define B uh, to be the integral closure of A in L. And now the statement, then B is also a DVR, a discrete valuation ring. B is a free A module of rank N. And this N is this N. And L is complete with respect to the topology given by B. We're not gonna prove this, but let's unpack it for a few minutes. All right. So, these kinds of hypotheses, um, if you've been following Hansen's course, shouldn't be too surprising, right? 
in Hansen's course, I mean, he didn't start with a complete field. He started with Q, right? So, so you know, there would be Q here, right? But he is studying finite extensions of Q, which he's calling number fields as, as normal, right? And um, the ring of an integer of the extension is the integral closure of Z in the extension, right? So this is like a, a situation in number theory that we care about all the time, like no matter where you're in, whether you're in a local field or, you know, Q or whatever, right? You have, you know, your little field with its little integers and you make an extension and you want, you know, the big extension to also have bigger integers. So this is what's happening here, okay? And what we get in the case where K is a complete, um, and, and A is a DVR, right? K is complete and A is a DVR, is first that B is also going to be a DVR. So it's really nice that, you know, the ring is inheriting that property, right? So it's a little bit like, you know, the ring of integers is like also a Dedekind domain, right? Z is a Dedekind domain and then the, you know, bigger integers are also have these nice properties. This one, B is a free A module of right N. All it means is that B looks like a direct series of some Ns, uh, of some As, just enough of them to fit, to fill um, L, right? L is of dimension N over K, and B is also kind of, in a sense, of dimension N over A, which, I mean, if you want to remove the in a sense, then you say, free a module of rank n that's the right thing to say but you should be thinking um like not in this setting right but for example like z i if if you forget about the multiplication right that's just z plus z right it's like a copy of z and then i times another element in z so if you forget about like that number i because number i only has to do with multiplication right if you just think of a plus i b when you're only adding right you're gonna add like the a with the a and the b with the b right like it's just like a z that you add with the other z and a z that you add with the other z so it's just like two copies of z right and all rings of integers are like that they're just like a certain number of copies of z of course with little alphas so that we know how to multiply but if you forget about that right it just looks like a bunch of z's that's all it means to be a free z module of rank n and in this setting, right, I mean, you replace the Z with the A, it's a free A module of rank N. If you forget about the multiplication, it's just like a bunch of copies of A, giving the coordinates of your little element. Okay, so that's, I mean, so this is the kind of thing that's like super nice, right? But also that you don't appreciate it until you're like deep in the weeds. So, you know, appreciate it the amount that you're able to right now. And finally, right, the extension is also going to be complete. So you started with a complete field, you know, and a DVR inside of it. And when you do a finite extension, you end up in a very similar situation. You have a complete field, you have a DVR as its ring of integers. So that's nice. This is like kind of what gets us going. You know, it's not impressive, right? Like it's, it's not impressive when someone's like, yeah, everything works in your house. You're like, yeah, I better hope so, right? But imagine if they said that there was a leak, right? So it's like, if I couldn't write this for you, then kind of like the whole thing would end, right? So, so this is good. It, it gives us somewhere to, to start. Okay. So now um, let's drop the completeness assumption for a minute. Okay, so, but keep everything the same, right? So we'll have L over K, a finite extension. We'll still write N to be the degree of that extension and B, the integral closure of A in L. Okay, now I dropped the completeness assumption, but I'm going to have to make a different assumption to keep going 
if B is a DVR, right? I mean, if K is complete, then B will be a DVR, right? But I'm just saying sometimes it will happen that B is a DVR without A being complete or K being complete. So like that's still okay, right? So um, this will happen if K is complete. but can also happen just because. Okay, well, um, let's put ourselves in that situation, right? We have our field L over our field K. We have, you know, the ring of integers A um, kind of like sitting over, sorry, B sitting over A, right? And now both A and B are DVRs. So both of them have a unique prime ideal. So I'm going to denote the prime ideal of A. I mean, it, it looks like a Weierstrass P, but it's meant to be a fractor P. And uh, B by, I think that's capital fractor P. It kind of looks like a beta. Okay. And um, by the kind of stuff that, um, Hansen's been talking about, which also applies here, this prime has to divide this ideal when I think about it up there in B, right? B because that's it, right? So, so um, consider, right, PB, that's an ideal in B. So then you're like, okay, I'm going to factor my ideal. Except that in this situation, there's only one ideal, the big P, right? So it's got to factorize like that, right? Um, so this one is that one to some power, right? And actually, let me bring everything. There's just so much more I want to tell you about this. So this is just all the same that I was writing. If you were copying, I just brought it over. Right? And if I take B and I mod out by its prime ideal, it's actually a maximal ideal, it's a field, right? That, that would be, um, you know, what Sarah would denote L bar over A mod P, right? So L bar over K bar. So now we see the notation, right? I guess I would have had to do like a little L, so. I am I am bested by Sarah. Yeah, I can call this number F. Okay, but I don't need I's, right? Because I only have one prime. That's that's what my course is better. That's what my course is easier. <laughs> we only have the one, right? And it's still true that N, right, the degree of the original extension is E times F. There's no G, right? Because there's no number of primes above it. G is one. So it's just E times F. That's still correct. Okay. So if I'm in a situation where I have a base field, a field extension, and I'm so lucky that the upstairs ring is also a DVR, then I have, you know, a very simple situation because, you know, there's only one prime downstairs, there's only one prime upstairs. Okay. Okay, so now I want to talk about um, two situations. The first one is where E is equal to, oh no, actually the first one I'm going to do is when F is equal to N, right? So no ramification, that means like E is equal to one. So that's the totally unramified case. And then I'll say a theorem about when E is equal to N. So when it's totally ramified, like there, this one is one, right? So they're kind of two extremes. So I'm taking no position on the ramified versus unramified. They're both good. It's the middle ones that I'm not going to talk about. Okay. So this is um, in section one or chapter one, section six. Proposition 16, if you want to go read, right? So in that setting, with all of that notation, if E is 1 and F is N, right? So all of 
the extension is in the residue field extension, there's no ramification. Um, and um, L bar over K bar is simple. Okay, so this is a field extension. Um, and simple means, i.e., um, there is alpha bar in L bar with L bar is just K bar adjoin alpha bar, right? It's a, it's a simple extension that can be, ex that can be given by only one element. This will be true if um, L bar over K bar is separable. So for example, if your residue field is a finite field, Right, every finite extension of a finite field is separable, so that would be that would be true, right? So if you're thinking about two p, if you're if you're following my advice of not doing PMC symbols, right, then you know just like forget about that whole condition. This this is all you care about because this is automatically true. If you want to think about complicated things, that's your own problem. Okay, um, then. Let alpha in B be a lift of alpha bar, right? Because like alpha bar is in the residue field. It's like something mod that prime ideal. So take one of them. F it's minimal polynomial over K. Then this ring B is monogenic. All right, so Hansen's dream is realized in this case. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, yeah. Let me just put, it's true, it's very confusing. I agree. B mod. I mean, like the prime ideal of B. Oh, no, I called it fancy. I forgot that I gave it a name. And then K bar is a mod. It's fancy P. Yeah, here I accept the notation because I have two residue fields. Okay, so in the totally unramified case, as long as the residue field extension is simple, um, then every integer ring is monogenic. So that's great. Um, the next case that I want to do is the other one, right, where um, E is N and F is 1, the other extreme where everything is in ramification. And then uh, the same thing is going to be true the ring of integers is going to be monogenic. So let me write that down. So this one is uh, chapter one, still section six, but proposition. I wrote one in my notes and like that's absolutely incorrect. So I'm going to guess. Yeah, I'm not going to guess. Like maybe 17, but it's not like immediately after. So it's like gr greater than 16 for sure. Um, if E is N and F is one, right? So the totally ramified case and, um, the ideal in B is generated by some pi B, right? Cause B is a DVR. So it's prime ideal is generated by, you know, it's own little pi, pi B. Okay. Um, and F is the minimal. polynomial of pi b, then um, b is also monogenic. It's ax mod fx, the minimum polynomial of that one. So, these are reasons why you might want to work over 
the piatic numbers instead of the rational numbers or the integers. What you can do, right, so I'm just going to go back, right, and is, is start, you know, with Q and then complete it, get QP, right, then you get into this like very nice situation where the ring of integers in your extension is always a DVR. So you're um, in this situation of if B is a DVR, right? And then, so essentially when you're working over QP, a lot of the time you'll just have like a very simple ring of integers that you can express, like just in a polynomial in, in the bottom ring of integers, right? Like you don't need to compute like a basis or, or whatever, anything like that. And of course, you know, the ramification story and splitting of prime story is a lot simpler because there's only like the one prime everywhere too. So that's, that's some of the, that's advantages of working in that setting over the global numbers. And because there's a lot of connections between, you know, Q and QP, a lot of the time you can bring your results back to Q if, you know, sometimes you, that can help you say something even over Q, right? It's not like you've gone into a world where like everything is beautiful. So like nothing you find there is true in the real world, right? A lot of the time you can bring back information that you found there. And I'm going to try to talk about that. Um, a little bit more tomorrow when I talk about like decomposition groups uh, and that kind of stuff. All right. You know what? Like, we, I'm not going to start something else in three minutes. I think we should all take three minutes to relax later today. So um, I'm just going to end, end here and, and take questions after. Yeah, thank you. All right, questions. Oh, thank you so much.